What I want to talk about today is communion. And one of the things I love about communion is just the simplicity of it. And I want to take us to a, this is a very familiar picture uh, done by Leonardo da Vinci. It's not, it's not historically accurate. They probably wouldn't have been sitting at chairs at uh, a table. But the, the, yeah, they would have been reclining at table. They would have been probably sitting on the floor in mattresses. But that's not the point. That this, this depiction of how God had His disciples around Him, close to Him. You know, I just want to, God is setting a table for us to take communion today. And just as we introduce this, I just want to say there's a real simplicity of communion. I mean, it's just, God doesn't make things complicated. I love you. Here is a piece of bread. Here is an emblem of, of my blood that was shed for you. God just, God just be real simple with us today. That's probably all we can handle anyway, but we thank you for the simplicity of communion. There's also something very personal about this. You know, commun- the first communion could have been handed down by an edict from heaven or something. But it was Jesus, very personal, sitting within their ability to touch Him. You know, part of the communion last supper, it says the disciple whom Jesus loved leaned on Jesus' breath, breath, uh, breast. They were that close. As we take communion this morning, Jesus is that, can we just say that close? That's where He is. He is that close to us. And that is His heart and His desire. In the simplicity of communion, to be that close, as close as these guys were to Jesus that day. And the other just simple thing in in introduction about this is what Jesus does always requires a response from us. He said, take this bread, which is an emblem of my body. Take this wine, which is an emblem of the blood. And they had a decision to make. They, made all that, they all made a very wise decision. What was it? Yes, I will take that. How many of us will take what God is, in the simplicity of His love, is offering us? Lord, we, wanted, we want more of You. We want it all in Jesus' name. So that's just three simple observations about communion, which we're going to end the service uh, with communion this morning. But uh, let me just set the context here again that uh, they're sitting down at the Last Supper. When the hour had come, Jesus sat down and the 12 apostles were with Him. I thank you, God, that He is with us. He is, and we are, he is here and we are with Him. We're not studying an abstract concept. He is literally here with us in this room right now. He, we brought Him in in our hearts, but He is with us individually and corporately right now. Could life be any better than that? The living God wants to be with me. The living God wants to be with you and with us. And he said, with firm desire, I've desired to eat this Passover before I suffer. We know we're beginning this, some some messages about the Easter season. We know what is, what is, what is coming soon. By the way, three weeks from this morning is, is Easter. And we look forward to celebrating the risen Christ together that day. Amen. It doesn't get any better than serving our risen Savior. Now, I'm going to read a couple of familiar verses. And Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Very familiar verses. You know, here is a companion verse. It's actually out of 1 Corinthians. In the same manner, Jesus also took the cup after... Bread was they took before they ate, and they took the emblem of the, the wine after he ate. I'm glad there's a meal in between where God just, things happen when there's meals together. Just families, friends, just having meals together. But to the other side of the meal, he took the, the cup saying this, very familiar words, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. I'm glad God is a new covenant with you and me. We ought to just be amazed by just the good, overwhelming goodness of our God. You know, this do as often you, as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, we think, you know, when God has done things in us, it'd be the easiest thing in the world to remember. How many of us know we need to be intentional about remembering? You know, there's a kid's song that we love. It's called Don't Forget to Remember. 
We need to do something and make sure that we have something intentional in our life that we can't forget, but we will remember. You know, don't forget to remember, you know, is, is this song. But we need to find, whether it's listening to a song, we need to find ways that we can intentionally hang on to what God has told us. You know, I've never been much of a journaler, and I've probably done more journaling in the last couple of years than I've done in my whole life. And one of the things I find is very, very helpful. I can go back and things that, you know, uh, a month ago, a year ago, I read and they, they were just, I had completely forgotten that God said that to me. And it's so encouraging to go back and read this again. I'm glad that I found a way that I can remember it because I had forgotten it. I forget who the, pre the preacher was. He talked about, we want our bucket full, but sometimes I leak. Yeah. I don't know if your bucket has any holes in it, but I've got a hole or two in my bucket. I need to make sure that I have a way to remember what God has done. So beware lest you what? Forget. Now, how could, lest you forget that God brought you out of the land of Egypt, how could they possibly forget? How could they forget they had three million people walking in the desert? They had the, the most powerful army in the world behind them. Moses lifts up the rod according to what Jesus said. This body of water, if you take a look at the Red Sea on the map, it's not like Lake Weatherford. It is a big body of water, and it parts, and they can walk. It doesn't say they walked over on muddy ground. It says they walked over on what? Dry ground. I mean, there's a whole series of miracles that are in here. And before the Egyptian army even got in there, it says the Lord twisted the wheels of the chariot so that they couldn't drive. There's a whole series of miracles that these people saw that saved their lives. You would think, you say, I would never forget that. Beware lest you forget what God did for you and for me and for us. None amongst them were like. Yeah, it was a whole series of miracles. Their clothes didn't wear out. They had bread from heaven for 40 years. I mean, God, turn our forgetter off and let our remember be very, very acutely strong. Let it remind us every day. Knox, do you remember what God did about this? I, need, I mean, I need this. This is stuff I need in my life to have this ongoing thing that rises up in me. So why should I worry? Why should I fret? Because I've got a mansion builder who's not through with me yet. Boy, I've just brought, well, that's, that's a song from second chapter of Acts for 40 years ago. If I hadn't even heard, I haven't thought of that song in many years. But we need to have a strong remember because here's, I mean, this verse is saying, don't be sure you don't forget. Here's a verse out of Psalm 76. It says that God commanded the Red Sea to dry up. They went across the sea as if the sea of Israel is a desert, number two. Number three, he rescued them from the enemies. Number four, he redeemed them for foes. Number five, the water returned. Number six, they covered their enemies so that none were saved. And it, what did it say happened? They quickly forgot. You've got to be kidding me. So we need to make sure we have something that we don't forget. And I love this expression out of Deuteronomy. You shall remember well. God, help us to remember well what you're doing. It is good. And God, God gives us every tool that we can remember. And let God help us remember well all that you've done for us. And... You know, we can do that in all kind of ways. Your way of make, making sure your forgetter is turned off and your remember is really strong and really dialed in to the Lord. May, the way that the Lord directs you to do that may be different the way He directs me. But, you know, we can, we can sing songs. You know, we can, uh, uh, we, can, we can write journals. I mean, whatever it is that causes you to be able to remember, I encourage you to do it. But here's one way we can do it is what David did when he was having a tough time, a tough challenge, and he started talking to himself. You remember we talked out of Psalms 42, 43 a few weeks ago about trusting God. One of the things that was a matter of trust is talking to yourself. I will say to my soul, is what David said in Psalm 42 and 3. And in Psalm 77, he says, I will remember all that the God has done for me. And it says, as a matter of fact, the second thing is going to do, I'm going to say, I will remember the works of God. I will remember what he's done. And number three in this list, what is it? 
I surely I will remember. Do you think David had an intentionality about making sure he could go back and say, look what my God has done for me. And Lord, help us be very good at remembering. That's the first thing I see is we're going to take communion this morning. God, let us be people who remember. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. God, help us be great rememberers. People who remember. The second thing we're going to talk about is how communion is a great opportunity to repent. You know, the Lord's Prayer has a... The frequency of the Lord's Prayer, I believe, is something that is a pattern of prayer that God wants us to pray, oh, two or three times a year maybe. Just when we feel like it. What is the pattern that God has in, in the Lord's Prayer for us to pray? Give us, now look at the redundancy, give us this day our daily bread. Do you think God wants to pray this every day? I think so. I think it's inherent in the pattern. God wants to pray this every day. One of the things that's in that pattern of prayer for every day is, Lord, forgive me my sins as I forgive those. But, Lord, forgive me my sins every day. And we need to be people, you know, we're very familiar with the message of repentance. Of repentance literally means to turn around, go the opposite way, things we were doing that were stupid against God, that we're turning around and going against, we're going to go to the things that, that honor God, that please God that strengthen others, that let His love flow out to other people. And so we know that people need to repent to know Jesus. And we're familiar with many verses in the Bible like this one that talk about uh, that Paul had a message, all the disciples had a message for the Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity, the necessity of repenting from sin so they can have faith in Jesus. Well, we know there's millions of people, billions of people who need to know the necessity of repenting so they can know Jesus. And Lord, help us be conduits for that message of grace. It's called good news. But we also know that this applies to us. Now, here's, there's many verses we could give along these lines. But here's a verse out of uh, Revelation chapter 3, which is uh, addressed to the church of Sardis. And of course, this is not talking to the people who don't know Jesus. It's talking to who? People like us who are believers, who know the Lord. Go back to what you've heard and believed at the first. Hold to it firmly. And what does it say for us to do? Repent. And that's, the Lord is speaking to me. Knox, let me, every, every way that my ways are cockeyed to what my plan is. So Lord, help me turn the other direction on the, on the things that I am aware of and the things that I have no clue that I'm doing things that you don't believe. God, I want to repent. I want to, be, I want to come in communion and say, Lord, Help me turn in every way that I need to turn. Repent and turn to me again. So it's obviously very clear, just reminding us that obviously the unbelievers need to repent for the first time to come to know Jesus. And all of us who know Jesus need to repent and turn to him again. Amen? There's only two people, types of people in this world. People need to know Jesus and people like us who need to know Jesus more. Now, we know as we repent as believers that God is there. Uh, there's two just beautiful uh, verses that we're familiar with out of Lamentations chapter 3. Let us search and try our ways and let us, can we read that together? Return. God, we are returners. We love to return to you, return to the Lord. We lift up our hearts and our hands and we say, God, we've sinned. I've sinned. And heal me. Forgive me for that. So I lift up my heart and my hands and I say, God, heaven, thank you that you have forgiven my sin. That's part of what we can do in communion. And every time God sees that tenderness of heart for us to turn away from things that don't please him, we can run right again into God's great love. How many of us would like to walk out of here with just a, one more drop of God's great love this morning? Well, he wants that for you and me more than we desire it from him. So God, just inundate us with your great love this morning. And his compassions never fail. Yes, hallelujah. And when the sun rose up this morning, by the way, you talk about a beautiful morning. Woke up and it was, you know, right at 
freezing, you know, beautiful blue sky and not a breath of air. I went out and ran. I just had to get out and take my prayer time. I love to pray when I run, but I had, I just so beautiful out this morning. I had to take my prayer in my sneakers and run around the neighborhood. But it's a reminder as we start in this beautiful day that God's compassions never fail, but they are new <laughs> every morning. God is constantly, you were told, I think in 2 Samuel 14, that he devises ways to restore the banished to himself. Now, isn't that amazing? We may think of people that are so, their life is so jacked up. You think, I don't know how God can fix you. You know what he says? I'm the God who devises ways. I may be able to set Joe, you know, Susie, whoever it is, free in ways that have never happened before because my mercies are new every morning. And I devise ways to give people a pathway to come to me. I want to repent. I can't wait to repent this morning, you know, when we do communion, you know. And we can say together, great is your faithfulness. When we come to the Lord and, and repent this morning, we're, you know what we're running into? We're not running into, you know, the proverbial father who says, you'll never amount to anything. We're, we're, we're going to a God who says, I'm going to pour out my goodness, my loving embrace. I love the Old Testament uh, word for uh, love, which means literally to wrap his, God's going to wrap his arms around us as we come and say, Lord, forgive me for things that I've done that don't please you. So we remember, we repent. But I believe that there's two more that are really important too, that as we take communion this morning, I want to remind us of. Out of Luke chapter 24, we know that this is, this is not actually uh, at the communion table at the Last Supper. But this is the context here is this is with the, the two on the road from Emmaus and they've just, uh, Cleopas and the, and the disciple was un, unnamed. I love that. There's two disciples that went to Emmaus. One is named Cleopas and the other we don't know what their name is because you know who I, I believe the name of the other one is figuratively? It's Paula and David. It's us. We can put ourselves in the story. God, we want to walk with you. We want our hearts to burn with what you're showing us about how Jesus Christ fulfilled the scriptures and he's still he's walking with us. And so we know that uh, that day at the end of the day that uh, Jesus was they were they found a place to stay. They're going to sit down and have a meal. Sounds kind of like the Last Supper, didn't it? And Jesus said he would have kept going. But they said, no, please stay with us. You know, how many of us know God wants us, He wants to stay with us? How many of us want to invite Jesus? Lord, don't keep going. Stay right here with us. I believe He's going to be with us as we take communion this morning. And something is going to happen. You know, we know that there's error in part of one part of the body of Christ where they believe that literally the bread and the wine become literally the body of Christ. Well, we may not believe that, but there's something much more to communion than just remembering. God wants to do something spiritual between us and Him when we come to Him. And here's what happened here when they took, when they sat down to eat, Jesus took the bread and blessed it. Then He broke it and gave it to them. Sounds very, again, this is not the Last Supper. This is not where Jesus introduced uh, uh, communion. But the, the context is very, very similar. And suddenly something happened. Somebody say suddenly. suddenly. Whenever we come to the Lord, the veil is taken away. I believe as we take communion again this morning, God is going to do, do something that's right out of this verse. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized Him. I want to recognize my Savior in a fresh new way today when I take communion. And I believe the invitation from heaven is there for us. That we want to say, Lord, don't keep going. Sit down with us at this table. We want you to be right here with us. And as we take this together, I believe that the Lord will do something that will suddenly make our eyes open and they recognize Him. Now, I believe it may be a seed that we may not recognize. I'm not saying we'll have a, a vision of angels the moment we... But I'm, what I am saying is God is going to do something to open our eyes to recognize Him when we take communion this morning. Because that's what He desires to do 
And that's what the pattern that I see from this scripture. Suddenly, their eyes were open and they recognized him. How many of us would like to be able to recognize Jesus more when we take communion this morning? We say, Lord, do that. That is our heart's desire to see more of Jesus. We want to remember you. We want to repent. And God, also, we want you to reveal yourself to us. We want to see more of Jesus. And we believe that communion is something that's supernatural in our hearts. And we invite you, Lord, to reveal yourself to us. I'm reminded of this familiar verse out of Ephesians 1. That this is the prayer, Paul's prayer for the, for the churches. And he says that, that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ may give you the spirit of wisdom and what? Revelation. That means the apocalypse, the unveiling. I believe one of the patterns of Scripture that God wants us to expect, whether we take communion in our homes, whether we take communion in a, in a church setting, He wants to reveal Himself to us. That's what He did with with these two disciples, with Cleopas and, and people just like you and me. So I believe that God, as we take communion, God wants to bring a revelation of His goodness. The fourth and final thing that I want us to talk about briefly before we take communion together comes out of John chapter 6. Now John chapter 6 is a very, very pivotal uh, chapter. It occurs right after Jesus has done one of the miracles of feeding the thousands. So you'd think that the people there, all there's thousands of people there, you'd think they'd be really dialed in and say, I want to know Jesus. Thank God for the gate. He gave us a meal. But I want Jesus. I want to know this Savior. That's who we need. And Jesus gave them a teaching in which he says, I am the bread of life. I have to say that again. I am the bread of life. Let me tell you why I want to say that. On December the 6th, 1977, when I was an unsaved graduate student and my life didn't look anything like a template of the image of the living God, believe me. And I was going down, I was, I was studying, and I went downstairs to put some toast in the toaster to just take a quick study break. And I just felt like this... this quiet whisper in my spirit said that's not really the bread that you need I go whoa now I had some inkling that there was a spiritual life out there but anyway I had just this quiet peaceful impression that's not the bread you need I go whoa so I just put the bread back in the wherever you know the refrigerator and I just felt quietly drawn to go upstairs and I went to my book, my bookshelf, and I had a whole, I had a whole rack of like yoga books. And I mean, I was a spiritual new age gypsy. And of all those books, there was one book on that shelf that I hadn't opened in years. And I just felt drawn to take this old King James Bible off the shelf. And I had no idea. I had no, I mean, I grew up I grew up in a denominational church, so I mean, I had some basic understanding of the Bible. But I had no clue why I was drawn to take that book off. You know, you almost had to blow the dust off of it. But somebody had given that to me, and I, I just couldn't throw it away. Aren't we glad God keeps, sows those seeds in our life, and whenever we're ready, He's there. He's there. He's there. He's here right now. And so I felt like I ought to take this Bible off the shelf. I had no clue where to open. And remember, the Lord said, you don't need that bread, that, you know, or a wheat, sprouted wheat bread, whatever it was. Because I ate healthy. But it's, it's immaterial. But I opened to John 6, 38, where Jesus, the first words I read, where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And I just felt like chains fell off my life. Blinders fell off my life. Addictions to stuff fell off my life because He is there. So this, this verse means a whole lot to me. Because I know just the way this was simple, and it was personal, 
the God of the universe met me in my living room, in my, in my bedroom, and spoke to me who he was. By the way, this, this was at a time when I was praying, Lord, I know Jesus Christ was a person who lived. I think he was a good guy, but I really don't know who he was. And I'm just asking the great cosmos out there with God, well, whatever's out there, who was Jesus? And God heard me in a very simple, personal way. He looked me lovingly in the face and said, I am the bread of life. So this verse means a whole lot to me. But we, to put this back in the context here, Jesus, after saying he's the bread of life, goes on to tell them something very, very shocking, not once, but four times. Do you think he's trying to get his point across? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. What was the response? Almost everybody said, see you. Because it was overwhelming to them because they didn't understand. Does God ever do anything in your life that you don't understand? I want to be like Peter and do what Peter said. Many disciples left, so this is hard to, hard to understand. Who can accept it? Jesus was aware of this, and he said to the disciples, well, are you going to leave too? And here's what Peter said, and let this be your cry and mine. Lord, to whom would we else, where else would we go? God, I'm hanging with you. I, I'm hanging with you. I, I, I want to grab hold of your hand. I want to be like the kindergartner holding on to the rope I mean, uh, of the teacher. I, I'm, I'm not letting go of the rope. And so Peter wisely said, Lord, to whom should, would we go? You have the words that bring eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Would you say that last proclamation for me? I just believe I've got to let it come out of my heart. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God, the Messiah who sent to redeem mankind. And God, we are going to stay with you. Which brings me to the fourth and final thing that I want us to meditate on as we take communion this morning, is we want to rely on God. And it's really, I would even say it's like a radical reliance. I mean, when Peter said, Jesus, we're hanging with you, I mean, he put everything on the line. When everybody else was going the other way, I mean, most of us seen the chosen, you know, the graphic they show at the beginning of the chosen. There's a thousand fish running, swimming in this direction, and there's what? There's one or two fish that are swimming in this direction. I want to swim that direction. I want to be swimming to Jesus. And so the, the fourth thing that I see is that we want to have a radical resemblance. So here's the things that I see as we come to take communion this morning. We want to remember Jesus, that we will repent because we all need it, or I need it. I, that you, you have to make that confession, but Lord, I need to repent. I want to look more like Jesus tomorrow than I do today. And God, I know that as we come to you, you will reveal yourself to us. We will see you. We will see insights about your goodness, your love, your character. And God, we say we ain't going anywhere. We say, Lord, where else would we go? And I guarantee you, God will put us in situations where we need to have a radical reliance on Jesus or we're going we're gonna to go the way of the masses. And I want to say like Paul did, or like Peter did, Lord, where else would we go? We believe and we know that you are the Holy One and we're not going anywhere. And that's what I'm going to say. That's what we're going to say. Part of what we're going to say when we take communion this morning. God, we're not, we're with you. We depend on you. It would enable us, all these things would enable us to do what Paul talked about in Galatians 2. This is all about Jesus preparing for his Passover where he knew it was coming. He said, Passover, we looked at the first verse we talked about. He knew that he was about to suffer. We can say, as believers who believe that God was suffered, died on the cross, and rose again from the dead. And can we just read this verse together? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, for you. 
for each one of us. Sorry I misread that partially, but we all get the picture here. And here's the last verse that I want to share that Jesus, at the end of the last person talked about it in Colossians, is a person named Archippus. God wants us to take communion that we all can complete, fulfill what he created us for. You know, we could, it says, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you've received from the Lord. We could fill in the blank. You know, tell, tell Joe, tell, tell Barbara, fulfill the ministry. We can say, Lord, I want to take communion that I can fulfill everything that you've created for, which brings us back to our starting point. It says, Jesus, this is my body. Or Jesus said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he also took the cup and he says, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.